Good afternoon or morning, wherever you are. Welcome to our first podcast of Mr. Shipman's Class. I'm so excited to be here to get this first one done and to speak to everyone all across this great country and world of ours. I'm Terrence Shipman, and I'm standing next to the beautiful and talented Miss Williams, Prudence Williams. Hi, everyone. Um, Again, I'm Prudence Williams. Uh, I'm going to be talking to Dr. Shipman today about his new series of books, education, and a lot of other really intriguing and interesting stuff. So sit back, relax, and welcome to Mr. Shipman's class. All right. Our first topic of the day, Ms. Williams, is what? What are the first thing we're going to discuss on Mr. Shipman's class? Well, since we are a program talking about education in a classroom, we're going to talk about teachers today. We're both teachers, so we can talk about teachers, right? Let's talk about it. All right. So I want to talk to you today about what I see in education. And I've seen this in my 24 years of teaching. I've seen two basic types of teachers. You have your academia versus your regular old teacher. Your academia are the people who love the discipline of their content. If they are English teachers, they love English. They can tell you everything about Shakespeare, everything about African literature, everything about Russian poetry. They have a strong mastery of the knowledge and the content. And they pour over the data of what their students are learning. They like to see that their kids are learning that content. Then you have your regular old teachers. And they love teaching children. Oh, not the old teachers. Oh, the old. old. (laughs) And actually, I find that a lot of the regular old teachers are indeed young teachers. They love children. They are tuned in with their students. And the kids love them. And they love parents. And their goal is... To increase content knowledge, Mm -hmm. but really what they want to do is to produce a full child that loves learning, that loves teaching, that loves school. So, what do you think? I agree. Um, I look at those three types of teachers all the time, especially on on the middle school level. And you see them a lot on the elementary also. You really need that teacher in the middle who loves the content and knows it but just have a love for teaching every day they walk in their school. And I'll be the first to tell you, every day is not a good day. Nope. I sit back and I hear teachers say, well, I teach great every day. You need to stop lying. No, we don't. No, we do not. We have bad days, but it's just the love for it that brings you back every single day. You love what you're doing, and it shows. The students can see it. The parents can see it. And your coworkers and your administration, they all can see that you love learning I mean, love teach. Well, it is teaching and learning. They see that you love it, but you have to have that balance. I really think you have to have that balance in education and as being a teacher. Well, Dr. Shipman, when I look at it and I look at the great teachers of history, Joe Clara, Escalante, uh, the teachers who touched lives and movies and books were written about them. What I find is that they are truly a blend. They know their content. They know their content. They are masters of math or English or whatever else they're teaching. But they also love their students. And they recognize that even the lowest student can be a student of excellence with enough time and the right teaching. And they go out of their way to reach these kids who are impossible to reach. And that's why we remember them. And so I think you are right. First of all, they all in their story showed they had bad days. They made bad decisions. They said inappropriate things. They definitely did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just a part of the job. Uh-huh. And then there are also the teachers who, even when they said inappropriate things, even when they had bad days, even when they lost their temper, they came back and were men enough and women enough to say, hey, I messed up. Mm-hmm. Let's try again. And we're going to push hard. And I'm going to hold myself to the same accountability and standard that I hold my students to. And And I'm going to hold my parents to that same accountability. Parents. That's a whole other subject. (laughs) But we need to, we do all need to be held more accountable, including parents. But that's a whole other show for another day. I really, I think the teacher that bothers me the most when I look at it, the three types of teachers is the one who's just in love with content. 
Yeah, they, they make me tired. They make me tired because I find, number one, teachers who are truly only in love with the content can only teach one kind of kid, the top kid. And the top kid doesn't really need a teacher. They need a facilitator. Right. They just need somebody mm-hmm. to point them in the direction of the learning. They're going to go learn it on their own. That is absolutely true. And with that teacher, they do not reach that student who needs the most help. That one who everybody who's give, has given up on them, who've been dogging them out for the last couple of years, what they need is that person who can balance again. I give you the content, but I'm going to sh- teach you, but I'm going to motivate you at the same time. I think now that we're preparing for testing that's coming up, what I've noticed is I had to find, I, I think I'm that middle teacher. I really make sure uh, I motivate my students, but also teach them. But you you have to motivate them, especially these days. If you don't motivate them, you're going to see students not performing the way you want to perform. Well, you're right. We're teaching to a generation of kids. We both teach in middle school. We're dealing with kids who are definitely a feedback generation. These are kids who, from the moment they were born, a computer screen, a camera, they're used to instant feedback. Oh, what a pretty picture. Oh, you did good posting and Snapchatting. And we're dealing with kids who need a lot of motivation. They need that feedback. They need somebody to click like, mm-hmm. hit the heart button, whatever. And a lot of times our lower kids are the kids who get the least amount of feedback, unfortunately. Now, Ms. Williams, I need you to help me. Tell me tell me about that third teacher, that, that one that we haven't really discussed yet. So we talked about the academia, and we talked about the teacher. Are you talking about the teacher who probably should have retired a long time ago or that stepped out of the field a long that's time ago? That's the one. Okay, so there are teachers who get into education for reasons that I have yet to figure out. They come in, they hate kids. I mean, flat out, do not like young people. Mm -hmm. Um, They do not like providing instruction. They cannot manage a classroom. And they do not want to take direction from anybody. Not from a principal, not from an instructional coach, not from a professor. They have no interest in it. But they come back year after year. They come back or they get students who uh, just perform well on the test because they're smart. Right. And unfortunately... With our test-driven world and with our teacher shortage, a lot of times those are the teachers who get the best kids because the principals recognize, I need my hardcore, I'm going to get down in the nitty-gritty teachers, the old-fashioned good old teachers with my lower group. And I need my academia with my honors group. Right. And so my kids who are in the middle who are going to pass the test because they have good parents Mm -hmm. and their parents are going to require be or better. Yeah. And they'll go home and study it by themselves until they get it, get those teachers who least care. But unfortunately, those are the kids who are going to support our country for years to come. Those are the kids who do the middleman work. And we put them with sometimes the weakest teachers. That's absolutely right. Um, so now we've hit all three. Which one do you see the most in today's teaching profession? Unfortunately, today's teaching profession is the profession is understaffed. Um, I have not worked in a school in the last 10 years that was at full capacity staff. Uh, and that's very unfortunate. So I'm seeing a lot of unprepared, unstructured teachers who probably mm-hmm. should not be in the classroom, who need a little bit more training, who need a little bit more time to grow, to need to figure out if they really want to do it. And I hear a lot of people say, well, get rid of them. Well, and that's an easy thing to say, but the reality of American education system is you can't get rid of them because you can't have 30 kids sitting in a room by themselves. And I think um, what I'm seeing, especially with new teachers coming in, we need to give them time to work on their craft. Yes. I think that's one of the biggest problems we have today in education. We go to meet, not to meet, not to meet, and that's another show that's coming up. <laughs> and we don't give them time to practice. You need time. You need a good mentor, number one. Somebody who's going to pull you to the side and take you through the ropes of teaching and teach you. But you also need to just give them time to practice their craft. So there are you saying what I see that there is no t- there is no on the job training. Uh, we, we take 22 year olds, 21 year olds, some cases 
and we picked them up from graduation from college mm-hmm. with their little degrees and their little teacher certifications. Mm-hmm. And we drop them off in the classroom and we say, go be great. Yep. And we come in and grade them on the teacher evaluation and say, hey, you you're didn't not do this. great. <laughs> right. <laughs> you're not doing this, this, this. Well, I don't know how to do it. Right. So I think it just takes time to give them time to do it and learn the craft. Let them learn the art of teaching, as I love to say, the yes. art of teaching. Yes, it's a beautiful art. Well, Dr. Shipman, um, you've written a book. Yes, ma'am, I have. Mr. Shipman's Kindergarten Chronicles. And actually, the first book is called December Celebrations. And we're moving into the second book soon. You'll get to hear about that. What's the second book? The second book is, uh, again, Mr. Shipman Kindergarten Chronicles, The First Day of School. So we got a series going on We here? have a series going on. All right. Well, how many books will be in this series? Right now, we're looking at between 10 or 12 books. It seems like it continues to grow. The more I look into it and the mind go to going, and I say, well, it started off as just 10. Now we're looking at 12. Who knows? By the time we finish, it might be... 14, 15 books. Who knows? So tell me what inspired you to write this series of books, Mr. Shipman's Kindergarten Chronicles. Well, I was a kindergarten. I started off teaching as a kindergarten teacher, and I taught for 11 years. And uh, just the experiences we had were fantastic. Uh, Not bragging on myself, but I did some innovative things teaching kindergarten. I think I was one of the first teachers kindergarten or not, to use video. To I used to make uh, VHS t- tapes. The old-fashioned kind. The old-fashioned kind. And send them home at the beginning of the first week of school. I re-record maybe like the second day of school, uh, the third day. What third, would you record? Uh, I would record myself saying the alphabet and the sounds. And so the students were able to go home and continue to learn. Once we, what we learn in school, take it home. Oh. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Well, Dr. Shipman, nobody can really see you, but I'm sitting here mm-hmm. with you. Uh, you are a, what, six foot? Six two. Six foot two, what, a mm-hmm. uh, hundred and ninety pound man? Uh, we'll say two hundred. Two hundred pound man. You're not a little guy. You're not a little guy. And I have mm-hmm. a child who was once mm-hmm. a kindergartner, yeah. and he was an itty bitty little thing. I mean, <laughs> if he stood three feet when he was five, that was it. He mm-hmm. was a tiny little thing. He might have weighed... 55 pounds the first day of school. Mm -hmm. How did that work with you being a giant of a man? You got this gray (laughs) beard, and I'm assuming when you were younger, it wasn't gray. It wasn't gray. It was black then. Uh, You you, you had hair at that point, maybe? Yes, a lot of hair. And and so how did you get to dealing with the little people? These little three-foot little people who come in and cry and need and want and they don't even know how to tie their shoes how how did that work out being a big strong handsome guy with mm-hmm. these little tiny people i think if you are a true i think if you're a true educator and you just love what you're doing it doesn't matter what grade you can you can you teach uh of course it was intimidating a lot of times not only for them but for me why for, so for you i can't for see. me to be uh someone bringing a f- uh five-year-old in sometimes even four-year-old and you're handed over to them, and they've never been anywhere before. They've never been in school. And you have them for the next seven to eight hours, and you have to make them feel at home. You have to make them feel relaxed and comfortable and love. I think no matter what, love is the most important thing in a classroom. Yes, I would agree. I would agree. I find that those teachers, again, mm-hmm. are the ones who are giving out love as much as content. Um, back to you in teaching. Okay. So were there other male teachers in the kindergarten staff with you in those 11 years? In those 11 years, no. We had a male paraprofessional, and we used to have a great time. Uh, I remember one, I'm going to get back to the question in a minute. One time we... You and the male paraprofessional. Right. For years, we, uh, my school that I taught at was across the street from the zoo. Uh, And so what we did... the other teachers would take all the students into the zoo. Me and him would stay out and we would barbecue. And that was the only time we really got to hang out. So we get over there first thing in the morning. We barbecue. By the time they came out, they had plenty of food. 
So, yeah, that was one of the fun times we had. Well, I, I'm a mother, like I said, and I have a, one son. And I, I think as a parent, I would look at you and go, oh, I, I think <laughs> I want my son to have more of a mother figure uh-huh. than a father figure. Mm-hmm. Um, now that he's older and has had a lot of good male teachers, mm-hmm. I look at it and go, did you ever have problems with parents just not wanting you to teach their babies because they are babies when we I, let them go. I think there are, there are always some parents who don't. But for the most part, no, because I had a balance. It was me. It, uh, I had some great paraprofessionals over the years. And all my paraprofessionals were women. So we gave them a balance. And it was actually in a home. I mean, our school, our classroom was more of a, again, that warm, loving home feeling. You had a male, you had a female. Both of us working together, and it made everybody feel so much comfortable. And then we learned, and it actually accelerated the learning because you had learning from two points of view. And one of the paraprofessionals I had, she was getting trained to be a teacher. So, again, it's almost like they had two teachers in the classroom at the one time. So you had that balance. And that helped me a great deal my first couple of years of teaching. Oh, okay. Um, when you look at teaching kindergarten, and... um. I feel, and I've read your stories and a lot of your background, and I know you feel that kindergarten is the most important year in school, that it is the year that prepares kids to be students lifelong term, lifelong students, lifelong learners. Um, what is an important message that we need to give to kindergartners and their parents? Because this is the first year of school. This is the foundation for 12, in some cases, 20 and 30 years of learning. What message should we give those kids? Um, I totally believe that you have to let students and parents know, hey, find out how great you can be, even at such a young age. Build them up with positive, positive, positive sayings. Build their self-esteem. I think uh, now kindergarten places too much emphasis on learning. I think the That so- academia yeah. again? The socialization piece to me is more important than the learning piece. I remember I had a student now who goes to Harvard. Uh, She could have easily skipped kindergarten and went to first grade. But her parents and I both agreed to keep her in my kindergarten class because she needed that socialization part. But today, like I say, she's still brilliant. It didn't slow her down one bit. she's at Harvard University doing great things and about to graduate soon. So you were in touch with several of your students. I'm in touch with a lot of my students. And we have a group on Facebook called Team Shipment. And I've what, I've been teaching 20, I'll get, get ready to be 25 years soon. I, that first class, I'm in touch with probably about five of those students. And overall, I'm probably looking at almost 200 students that I keep up with and they keep up with me. Let me say that's great. <laughs> All right. So you have had a very successful group of kids. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you today, uh, Mr. Shipman for being with us, Dr. Shipman. Uh, we never really did a formal introduction. So let me just do that really quickly. <laughs> this is Dr. Terrence Shipman. He is a veteran teacher, having taught in American public school systems for over 24 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, He has taught kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, and all of middle school grades, sixth, seventh, and eighth, and a couple of years in high school, correct? Correct. Um, He has written and is writing a series of children's books, Mr. Shipman, Kindergarten Chronicles, based off true events that happened during his first 11 years teaching Kindergarten. That's correct. Now you introduce yourself. Okay. I am Prudence Williams. I am a teacher. Also, I've taught 24, 25 years, somewhere in there. I've always taught in the middle school, 6th, 7th, or 8th grade. Have a deep passion for middle schoolers. Um, And I've been reading Mr. Shipman's books, Dr. Shipman's books, and really enjoy them. So, come back and talk to us again, um, everyone. And welcome and stay with Mr. Shipman's class. And in closing, let me end with one of my favorite sayings I see every day of almost every day in class. Uh, I am smart. I am special. I am somebody. And we hope to see you again on in Mr. Shipman's class. Thank you very much.
Mr. Shipman's class, Mr. Shipman's class.